Hi, I'm Jonathan Green, and this is the See a Guru podcast. In this podcast, I interview the various gurus on my new platform for helping people to find a coach to take whatever they're doing to the next level. My guest today on my second ever episode believes that everyone has a story worth telling. She helps people to take their story and turn it into words, whether by teaching, journaling, or recording. All in all, she helps you bring your words to life. She has a new book that's available on Amazon called God Was Holding My Hand. Link is in the description. And you can find out more about her on her Sia Guru profile at siaguru.com forward slash Rachel Arterberry. So please welcome Rachel Arterberry. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for having me on today. I really appreciate it. Look forward to speaking with you. Absolutely. So um, one thing we were talking about before we started recording was that um, there's a very uh, important event that happened in your life that kind of got you launched on your um, kind of trajectory towards um, being uh, so good at helping people bring their words to life. C- could you tell us a little bit about what that was? Sure. Uh, thank you for asking. Um, so I'm going to take a little step backwards in into history and tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I have, was working for a corporate company and I, I had a big career with lots of goals and ambitions. Um, and my family was was needing me. They, my children were small, and my husband was faced with a medical condition, and, and I couldn't be all things to all people. And uh, God put it on my heart that I needed to make a change. And that change was I decided to leave my corporate career and take a job. And that job was managing a small office, which gave me the ability to take care of my husband, who had just been diagnosed with a spinal cord injury, as well as take care of my small children to be the mom I wanted to be. Um, and really, the the Holy Spirit was, was telling me that... Um, that he would take care of it, even though I was leaving a job with a lot of money and a power and control, et cetera, all those things that we all strive for. Um, he had a plan, a bigger plan than what I even knew that led me to write my book. Um, uh, I had it on my heart that I had always wanted to write. And when my husband experienced this traumatic event, um, it really gave me the incentive to tell his story. Um, he had, uh, been limping for several years, uh, undiagnosed or no one could tell him for years and years why he began to limp and then eventually was becoming paralyzed. Ultimately, a, a, a fine doctor told us that he had a cyst on his spinal cord that was compressing his spinal cord, preventing fluid from flowing to his extremities and, and he was being slowly paralyzed. Unfortunately, because it was a slow death, uh, a nerve death, Um, there was no recovery, but, uh, the doctors were able to successfully remove the cyst and he is able to walk, although, uh, it is very belabored, but the whole point of the story is that God was holding his hand. He knew throughout his entire journey as terrified as he was to go under the knife and, and to face the risk of a surgeon, you know, doing something or making a mistake. Mm-hmm. Um, he knew that God was there with him and which prompted, uh, the title, God was holding my hand because he knew that when he woke up from surgery without a shadow of a doubt that God was there in the chair holding his hand next to him. And I knew that, uh, at that moment that that was, it wasn't just God telling me that I was to leave my job and to start writing, but that was my initial story that I had to tell. And that has now since kicked off my career in helping other people to tell their story. Um, Because I truly believe that everybody has a story uh, to tell. And it's in their own words. And it's how they feel inspired to tell it. Wow. That that is, I mean, that must have been a very traumatic experience for your whole family. Uh, What was it that... um, allowed you to to turn that story into words and to 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 make a book about it that that captured sort of the the depth of that experience that's a great question so uh you know faith-based family we we believe that um you know all of our steps are are directed and it, it we knew that the this was God's plan. You know, we, we all have plans in our life, right? And eventually we, 
we either um, follow in the footsteps that we think that we're we're supposed to, or in the ones that that God has directed. And although my husband had big plans to play football, he played football in college. He really wanted mm-hmm. to be a professional football player. This for him was um, God telling him that that wasn't God's plan for him, and that this was. And this event actually launched his career into motivational speaking because now he goes around sharing his story, inspiring others. Um, wow to be all that they can be despite or in spite of whatever history they have, whether it's an illness or sickness or trauma or whatever it may be. So, you know, we all believe that this was the trajectory that, um, that launched the whole family on, onto the path that we are all on now. Wow. And that, I mean, that, that feels so like God's character to take something that could be a traumatic, um, and harrowing experience and use it to flip it on its head to, to, to build up and to, um, you know, just raise people up instead of, um, letting it just crush them. So, I mean, obviously your, your faith in God is, is very central to, to all of this. And, um, I guess the, the one thing that jumps out to me is, um, not everybody would go through that experience and then be able to, um, turn it into a, a book like that? Like, did you already have um, a writing history or did you, did, I mean, did you have any sort of background that, that let you take that step or did you really just kind of go out in faith and, and, and mm. just learn from nothing or how did, how did you approach that? That's awesome. Um, I'm so glad you asked me. Uh, so, you know, when you're, you're a little kid and, and I'm sure everybody can relate to this, you want to be something, right? Everybody wants to mm-hmm. be something, right? I did not have it in my heart that I wanted to be a writer one day. Uh, That's not, it had never crossed my mind. I knew that I was good in English and I was always the grammar, you know, all the ones that all of my friends came to me for spelling and grammar. And, and I'm the kid that I'm the the person who driving down the street, I'm going to be the one that spots the spelling or typing typographical error on the billboard. I I Mm -hmm. always have that. I always had that gift, but it wasn't something that I felt uh led to do i had bigger aspirations or different aspirations but um it was that time in my life that um really god put it in my heart that he was going to take the gifts that he gave me and use them for what he intended not necessarily what i intended Right. I Mm -hmm. had dreams of uh, honestly being an expatriate. I wanted to to live somewhere else in the world and travel. And and that was not his plan for my life. And and I'm so thankful that uh, I listened and that I followed what he decided he wanted for me, uh, what Mm -hmm. he had plans out. And yeah, it's been a great journey because I I actually listened (laughs) and I I took (laughs) what he wanted for my life and I and I, I took the gifts and the talents that he gave me and I, I used them to to launch my career. So it's almost like you had um, – your, your original career didn't necessarily have anything to do with writing directly, right? Absolutely nothing. Yep. So no. God almost used this event as a chance to, to jump tracks and, and put you on a different course completely. And, and not only that, but yes. one that was closer to your heart and closer to his purpose that he had in mind from you or yes. in, mind in, in mind for you. Absolutely. For all of us, actually, like I said earlier, my husband's ideal career was he wanted to be a professional athlete. But uh, and for your husband, too. And now yeah. he, he's able to jump into um, motivational yes. speaking. Yes, he speaks all over the world uh, to um, podcasters, to adults, to teenagers, uh, all over, um, inspiring, motivating. Um, and and. And he knows without a shadow of a doubt that he, it was not God's plan for him to play professional sports. And, and the mm-hmm. fact that he was given this disability um, that made him stronger and made him really into the person he is today. Because he, without it, who knows what he would have been. You know, there's so many athletes out there that unfortunately they don't know how to manage their money or they go down the wrong, wrong path. And he knows that his personality, he may have been one of those people. But God Mm -hmm. said, nope, I have bigger plans for you. And uh, it may not be getting paid, you know, millions and millions of dollars uh, or playing on the football field, but I have plans for you as he does with all of us, right? So, yeah, the the 
as unfortunate as the incident was and, and the long years that he has spent um, with his disability, um, we know it was God's plan. It was his intention for for him to, uh, uh, you know, experience this and for, for my family. And, and honestly, it's good for my children, too, because they they help their father. They help around the house. They do what they have to do, knowing and having more empathy um, because, one, they they have to help their dad. And number two, watching him, uh, inspire and be a motivator and to change the lives of people around the world. Uh, and wow. I hope that they, um, learn from him and, and take that and carry it into their own lives. Wow. And, you know, I, I feel like there's got to be a lot of people out there who are in a similar situation where they're going a direction that God isn't happy with. And, that deep down they're not happy with either because you know he puts those uh passions into your spirit he puts he puts that into your soul and i think deep down you can feel when you're going in a direction that just isn't your calling isn't what you were made to be and so i feel like god has almost uh put you now in a position where you're able to sort of catalyze that same experience you went through but for other people and um i'm kind of curious i, I kind of dig into the how of that you know what First of all, what is the the big blockers that you see with the people that you work with? How how are they struggling to put their their story into words? Oh, that's that's a very easy one. Um, most people, uh, myself included, um, we feel that our story is not worthy of anybody else reading it. When, uh, in fact, we are all important. And we all have a story. Now, it may not be a story that becomes a New York Times bestseller. It may not be a story that reaches millions of people. But it's a story that whether it's for, the, um, you know, for publication or for personal, uh, for their family to share their legacy. Um, everybody is put on this planet with a story and with a journey that's worth recording, meaning putting, on, putting to paper. Because how will your future mm -hmm. generations know your accomplishments and your challenges and your struggles um, when you're gone without if, if you don't put them on paper? And uh, but that's the biggest problem is we all lack the confidence to start um, mm -hmm. because we don't feel that it's wor that it's worthy. But I, I would love to your readers to know that um, everybody has a story. And no matter what your reasoning for wanting to write your story, um, it's important. And there's somebody that will read it and that you are worthy of writing it and your story is worthy of sharing. Wow. wow. Um, I mean, what, well, how, do you, how do you go about um, making that, that jump? into saying, okay, I've got the story, you know, you've convinced me it is, it is worthy to, to be written, but how, how, how do you do the how side of it? Yeah. I mean, do, do you, uh, tell your story? Do you try and do it like a plot? Like, okay, I started as a little boy and then the, and this is my early childhood and then this is there. I mean, or do you take, do you start at like a certain event or just, I mean, how, how do you even get going with a, a task like that? Yeah, that's the next challenge that most people face, Jonathan. In reality, it's a that's a huge obstacle. Once they get over the fact that mm -hmm. that it's um, to build up the confidence to actually do it, the next obstacle is always, oh my goodness, how do I start? Where do mm -hmm. I begin? You know, do I begin at my current day or do I start at my birth? Um, mm -hmm. And in reality, it it doesn't matter where people start. If they want to tell their story from today um, and work backwards, that's fine. What I what I always recommend people to do is just simply sit down and do a brain dump first with all of the mm -hmm. important things that they want to start talking about. Maybe they want to talk about their marriage or their mm -hmm or their birth or their education or their immigration to a country or uh, their career. Um, but do a brain dump first. And then, mm -hmm. and then, you know, it's the, it's the, in working with someone like me, I can then help a person to sort it out. Meaning what order should it all be in and what details should be included. And, and, and I don't necessarily, uh, it's, it's the person's story. So I don't necessarily, um, I'm not creating the story, right? I'm just guiding mm -hmm. them to know what things may be interesting to someone. Uh, what mm -hmm. things uh, would 
um, would be important for the story. But it all begins with creating uh, just a brain dump of information. And it, that brain dump does not have to be in any particular order. That all comes later. The organization mm-hmm. and the flow of the story, that comes later. But the first part is to just start getting out the critical components of who a person is and what makes them um, who they are. Oh, okay. Um, you know, one one thing that you mentioned that is you help them to figure out what parts might be interesting to someone. So that that almost strikes me as another another thing that people would run into when they're starting to do this is they're thinking, well, okay, my story's worthy. Um, I, I see where to start, but it's not going to be interesting. Like Rachel, it's 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 boring. Like it's 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 not. Uh, I don't have a, a husband like you did who was, was suffering with some uh, some illness. Like my story's much more. More, more, I don't want to say boring, but like, how do you, how do you can, how do you do that? How do you find what what the parts are that you, you that uh, would actually be interesting enough to sustain a story? Well, the first thing I would recommend to anybody is to figure out who their audience is. Who's going to be reading this? Is it going to be mm. only fam- family members? Is it going to be something that that the author is intending is just going to be passed down to uh, their grandchildren or family members? Or mm-hmm. do they have a broader audience in mind? Because that's going to determine what's going to be interesting. Uh, for example, um, let's say you're trying to you you're an immigrant to this country, um, and there's you know there are millions and millions of people that have that have followed that same path. But what is interesting about uh, your story is that um, you were living in uh, India when the war happened and it was uh, split to to Bengali when it became Bengali. But for example, I'm just saying mm-hmm. that's interesting to somebody who may not have known that. But it's all going to be as who is reading the book or the story. Is it going to be... Um, you know, uh, somebody who lives in that country and did not know the history, or is it somebody who is not an immigrant and and never experienced anything outside of their original country? So that's really important. Is the the person needs to figure out who they're targeting it to, and that interest will then automatically it, it will flow from there. Hmm. Um. Wow. So, do you, when you're working with your clients, do you? tend to find that most people are writing this to kind of document their lives for their children or are do you are more of your clients looking to um kind of reach a broader audience or what, what do you find is more more common actually i have a very nice mix of both um and some people who are writing it for their families realize halfway through the project that they have a message and that's important as well as what is the message? Is it that you've struggled um, in your lifetime and you want to pass on to somebody about your mistakes? Or maybe it's the things that you did in business. But um, what is your message? Um, because, you know, everybody can write a chronological detail of their life. I was born on mm-hmm. th- such and such day and, and uh, you know, the... Uh, this is what happened. Um, but what is the message that you want to share? Um, is it that you struggled and you overcame? Is it, So that, I think that's important too, aside from the audience, is what is the message? And that will determine, um, you know, whether it's for, for broader publication or just for the family. In, in, in your uh, book, God Was Holding My Hand, the, the message is, I, I assume, at least from what we've talked about, that the message is that God has you. You know, you can feel safe yes. in in His protection. Yes, absolutely. And this was a clear example that, um, as much as He and I worried, and as much as we uh, were terrified, honestly, about what the future would hold, God was there, and God had a plan, and we had to trust His plan. And that's the message: is that we have to let go and let God. To let go and let God um, bring about His work in you. That that's yes. so. When you release this book, I'm I'm just curious. Did it? Um, when did you get the feeling that? Um, I guess that that the message had, had gotten across. Like when people started reading it, did did they just kind of be like, "Wow, you know this this is so true in my life," or this is you know, this is something that just really touched me or, 
Uh, can you just kind of talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so the title for one captures people's attention uh, because they they want they're curious. You know what 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 does that mean? God, you know, they think God can't really hold my hand um, because there's mm-hmm. faith involved there. So we get a lot of comments about the title in that, um, you know, that that alone is intriguing to people. Well, you know, what does that mean? Um, and then once they read it, and it's a very quick read, it's it's a succinct story, um, but it's powerful. And, and ultimately, uh, readers will say, that they had a revelation or maybe that they had an experience with God also, but they didn't realize it was God that something happened in their life where they were led oh, wow. to do something or led away from danger or, you know, uh, directed in their life, but they didn't yet know what that was that caused them to do it. You know, like I, before I wrote this book, I knew without a shadow of a doubt that the Holy spirit spoke to me and told me exactly how to, handle this. He told me exactly how I needed to go into my human resources department at my big international company and tell them that although it sounded crazy to me, it was illogical that they needed to terminate my position and let me go. Mm -hmm. Now, who, who in the right mind says that? Who who says that? But I did. And I didn't know why I did it. I didn't know the ultimate result. I didn't know how or what, or I, I just had to trust God. But the, the ultimately when the, when we published the book, it was all became clear that he was holding my hand too, because he had to impart in me the faith that when I walked into this HR office, that they weren't going to laugh my, laugh me out of the office, which they did. They laughed me away first. And it, and it took them months first at first to realize that I was serious. And that whether they let me go, I was ultimately leaving because I had bigger plans where, well, God had bigger plans for me. Um, but uh, I couldn't, exp- I couldn't explain it. I couldn't explain that. So, uh, because, but who's, because who's going to believe that? Who's going to believe that God said, right? Um, it's, yeah. it is difficult for many people to believe that. But in both of our cases, in my case, I believe the Holy Spirit told me that this was supposed to be, this is what I was supposed to do. And in mm-hmm. my husband's case, he knew that God was there holding his hand. Um, and, and it's an eye opener, I think for many people who may be, um, uh, like I said, may, may have had a, a, an experience, but didn't know what it was, or they did something that was illogical or irrational that their brain was telling them was not right. But yet they mm-hmm. figured that they had to do it anyway, because th- that's what it was. God was telling them to do it. Wow. Um, you know, let, okay. So let's, let's say that, um, you've got somebody out there who feels like God is calling them to put their story to paper. I mean, may- maybe they are in a similar pos- position to you where they feel like they always wanted to get into writing. They wanted to they want to start a writing career, but they're just a little scared about the next step. Maybe they have a job too. They're they're scared to walk in there and quit. Maybe they have a family. Um, they don't know how they're going to make ends meet. Uh, I assume when you're dealing with your clients, you must run into people in, in, a, in a similar situation to to the point where you, you, maybe you're not just coaching on the writing side of it, but you're almost helping them as a life coach. Like, okay, here's how you could go about um, actually going from he- where you are now to where you feel like God wants you. I mean, do you do you find that you deal with that? And, and if so, what do you would you advise people on that? Um, I, I do find that often because, um, going back to my, um, earlier statement about confidence, you know, we all lack the confidence, um, in so many ways, whether it's confidence that some, that your story is worthy or confidence that you can write it or confidence that you can step out in faith and actually do this for a living, all of that I've experienced it and, and it, and God continues to amaze me. Um, and I'll just tell you a little aside I mentioned earlier that, I was working a job while I was Mm -hmm. writing and um, again, the Holy Spirit led me that there was things happening in my job that didn't seem right. And he knew that I wanted to work full time as a writer. Um, But I was Mm -hmm. terrified. I was terrified. How am I going to support my family? I'm here. I am again trying to uh, change careers. And he knew this and he made it so that I was in fact let go 
um, which only allowed me to ramp up my writing and which I had already started and helping clients and helping authors. So um, he gave me no choice because he knew that I was too terrified to do it on my own. Right. So he, he ended my position at the company at, at the, the job and, um, gave, and opened the door for me to do it. So my advice to others, um, is that n- number one, you have to b- believe that you can do it. Um, and mm. that God, God will <laughs> pun intended, hold your hand and guide you to, to do it, um, in the way he wants you to do it. And, mm-hmm. um, number two, that, um, it may take a while, you know, I'm not, I would never recommend for somebody to run out and quit their job immediately without mm-hmm. having some kind of plan. Um, and that does sound a little hypocritical because honestly, I didn't necessarily have a plan. Um, uh-huh. and I don't, I don't mean it that way, but I had, so there was a, a mixture of faith and, um, reality that I, that were there. And that, um, what I and, mean and that, by that, that springs forth to me too, is that it's not that you didn't have a plan it's that you felt in particular, you felt prompted by the Holy Spirit. So it's more so yes. you had faith that he had the plan. Yes, exactly. And I was just listening. And it was a struggle because my my flesh was saying, wait, you're crazy. Don't do this. But I, I knew that I had to listen. Um, mm-hmm. And and I would uh, the advice I would give anybody is that, you know, number one, they have to listen to what they believe is their is guiding them. Um, and, and number two, that, you know, if it is meant to be, it will be. Um, and it, it, you can be profitable, you know, it, writing and editing, um, telling your story, it can be a very profitable business. Um, and it, it, it takes hard work and, and promotion, et cetera. But if that's what God has for you, it is in his will, then it will be. Wow. Um, so let's get it a little bit into, um, just kind of the art of telling a story. Um, do you do you work with clients who aren't necessarily telling their story, but maybe uh, as in not about them personally, but maybe about um, uh, just a idea for a book that they've always had that they've always wanted to tell? So maybe it's not their story specifically, but uh, the story of a character that just is very real to them. I mean, do you have any kind of tips for developing any story? So. Um... Yes, developing any story, I feel like is a it's a journey. Um, you know, if you speak to any fiction writer, it starts with a seed. They have a character in mind, and then the story evolves around that. Um, or maybe it's a location. You know, maybe they grew up on Martha's Vineyard, and and that's always inspired them to write a story. Whatever that seed is, it will grow if it's mm. nurtured, and um, the, the thing that I would recommend is that they take time to nurture it and to, um, water it and, and in, inspire themselves. Like a lot of times that what that means is, um, spending time in that location or with the person or, um, just, mm-hmm. uh, you know, maybe they're inspired, this character that they're thinking about is inspired by a person, a real person that they know. Um, they have to kind of go mm-hmm. with their gut and and wherever that starts and let it lead them. And maybe it leads them down a road that, um, you know, they decide not to go down later. But I think they have to start with whatever their initial inspiration is and go from there and kind of let it let it evolve and grow. Oh, wow. Okay. Um so, okay, let's let's say that um, they've they've got this book, they've put it out there, and they want to um, to market it and get it out there. Do you? Um, how do they take the passion that they have for their story or the passion that they have for their character and translate that into passion and interest in their market? Oh, that's a good question. Um... Not everybody's going to see the same passion in it that that they do, um, but they have, but they will um, through them. You know, n- even though uh, we've had a lot of non-believers uh, put the book down, our God was holding my hand. There's also many who were non-believers that 
through our passion about the story, decided to pick it up. And whether they became believers mm -hmm. or not, um, at least maybe they got to thinking about it. So y their passion for sharing a story will come through um, and inspire others. But they have to be willing to share that, to share the passion, to share the the motivation behind it. Um, because I think we, we all can read each other, right? We... Mm -hmm. You know when someone is passionate about something. Like, I hope your readers, uh, your listeners will hear that I am passionate about what I do. My yeah. my husband is very passionate about what he does. And I think that that comes out in uh -huh. us naturally. You know, if, if you were to ask me a question about the automotive industry, which I have zero interest in, then clearly I would not <laughs> express any passion about it. So, uh, you know, it, it's. If you're passionate about your story, it's going to come out. It's going to come out through the way you market yourself and, and people will see it and they'll want to read it simply by the by your elevator pitch, so to speak, and your the way that you express it. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> I, I agree that um, if you have a lot of passion for something, I, I feel like it does it does tend to to rub off and get others passionate for it as well. Um, Actually, I, I just had a, a podcast uh, episode one with uh, Bonnie Jean a um, Alford. Um, you guys should, if you're listening, check that out. That's a great one as well. Uh, basically, she talks about kind of drilling down to your identity and kind of finding out what, what is the diamond in the rough so that you can tell your story uh, more clearly that way too. And I feel like, um, do you, do you kind of, do you, experience that as well where somebody's story maybe has too much and you kind of need to chisel away at it to get to what it is at its core absolutely absolutely it happens all the time um where people want to share every last detail um and sometimes it's too much right so some there's a lot of mm -hmm. cases where we have no choice but to whittle it down because you know as much as we would all like to publish a 300 or 400 per page book sometimes the audience can't handle that much material so we also have mm -hmm. to think about who's reading the story and, and we have to whittle that down a little bit as well. How, how would you go about whittling it down? Like how, how do you bring out the, the, the core story? Um, part of what um, you do, you said, is you, you bring the words to life. And part of that, I think, is, is finding the words that uh, need to be heard and making them stand out. So how, how do you go about that? So that's kind of a... a a dual process, you know, making the author really think about, um, uh, does the, this specific content or detail add anything to the, to the essence of the story or the message? Um, you know, if, is it relevant that there was, um, X number of people in the room during a specific event or is that, uh, does it, add anything to to the story itself so I think that's kind of what I would recommend to anybody is think about the reader of your story um and what is it that they uh does it enhance the story I, I'm sure that we've all you've all read something that you thought well I didn't really need to know that who cares you know it, it is it relevant that's really the question you want to ask sure. yourself at, is it is it relevant to the story and to enhancing it making it better um or is it just idle words to, to get to a word count. Sure. Um, do you have any um, advice for people who um, are still struggling trying to tell their story? Like wh what's, um, what's some tips? Like if you're blocked doing it, what, what would be some advice you would have for, for trying to get past that? Oh, the first thing I always recommend is to step away. Um, you know, I find myself, if I'm working hour after hour, um, looking at the same document or working on the same material, uh, my brain doesn't function anymore, but I'll step away, you know, have a cup of coffee, uh, mm. uh, take your dog for a walk and I come back to it and I find that the inspiration is there or I've got a new, um, uh, something happens and all of a sudden I'm re-energized to get over that hurdle or that, or that block. So I always recommend just step away. Mm-hmm. And when you step away, it kind of, yeah, it gives you a time to think about what matters most about the story. W would you recommend as another way to help with that, having somebody read your story? Or, um, I mean, 
or having like, um, do you find that that helps? You mean during the process? It, yeah. it does. It does help because um, I made the mistake of not having somebody read my story, uh, my original story, and I regretted it later because there was mm-hmm. the person, uh, when a friend of mine read it later on, she asked me so many questions that had I thought about it or had somebody read it before, I, I said, oh, yes, I should put that in there or, or oh, my gosh, I forgot about this. So ha- having somebody read the story um, at certain points is very valuable. Um, it may also tell you not only what did you forget or, or may want to include, but also, uh, things that may be unclear to a reader or that the reader may have questions about. So it's very important that you have somebody read the story along with you, uh, you know, at, at certain points. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I feel like I would be almost embarrassed or maybe, um, shy or I don't, I, although that kind of, you know, tie it back to the beginning, that kind of comes back to, I guess, what you said at the beginning, which is having the confidence, feeling that your story is actually worthwhile. Yes. It, it, it's, you know, it's, um, it's a difficult part of the process because, of course, there's confidence involved. But bigger still, you want to find somebody that's going to be honest with you. You don't want just mm-hmm. somebody to say, oh, yeah, good job. You're writing a book. You need somebody that's yeah. going to give you honest feedback to say, look, this is good. You're maybe on the right track, but, um, and I feel like, you know, when you're talking about uh, being a guru, that's something that I truly, um, value. And I know that I offer to my clients is that is honesty, whether mm-hmm. it's a friend or a family member that you ask to read your story. Um, it doesn't really matter. But, you know, one of the things that I do is I read uh, client stories and I, I can give them that open, honest feedback to say, um, you know, this is good, but I think you should go in this direction or this is good. Uh, it needs work here. Or uh, what did you mean by this? Or, you know, a lot of times we have those thoughts in our head. They don't actually come out of our mouths or they don't flow through our fingers as we type. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, you as the author may have intended or thought that you shared the whole story, but somebody else reading it says, oh, wait a second. I don't know what you're talking about. Right. So it's yeah. important to, to get that out and get that honest feedback. Yeah. Uh, I mean, one thing I think about is is you go and tell your your family and they're just like, oh yeah, it's a great idea, great idea. So I almost have a question for you how how do you get honest feedback out of them? Or is it you know would you say if you're if you're having a lot of trouble with that, it would be good to seek for a mentor? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> I think that's very valuable to get somebody that will on will give you honest feedback that is not related to you because we're not close to you because. Mm-hmm. You know, they they don't want to hurt your feelings. They they don't. And and honestly, if if it's somebody that doesn't know you, it's not that they don't want to hurt your feelings, but you're more likely to get honest feedback versus your family who's who's proud of you for putting your words on paper and they want to see you accept uh, to be successful, but they may not necessarily know either um, what it is that would help you. You know, they it's easier for some people just to say, "Oh, you're doing a great job." than to say, you're doing a great job, but you should also add this, right? So it's uh, there's definitely yeah. a fine line between having a mentor and having a family member read it. Yeah. <laughs> and there's value. There's value to both, of course. Um, so let's talk about some actionable steps here. Um, step one, let's say that I want to uh, get my memoir, or, or not memoir, but let's say I want to get my story out there. What should I do first? After I've already decided that, um, it's worth telling, you know, what, and, and, you know, I've done, I've done my brain dump. What now? What now? Uh, well, there's a couple of avenues that I would recommend for, for new authors. Um, and the easiest one is to record yourself. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, people, one of the other blocks that people have or challenges is that they say, oh, I'm not a good writer or I don't type very fast or, or I can't, you know, I can read my handwriting if I write it out. You know, I Mm -hmm. always recommend to people to record themselves speaking because that's when we, number one, the truth comes out, right? We are, it's much easier and faster to go from brain to mouth than Mm -hmm. brain to hand. So I always recommend to my clients to record themselves um, speaking, uh, it, which can be transcribed later into words on paper mm-hmm. and then edited. So 
you know, the first step once they decide to uh, take that leap of faith and to start the process, and then once they do their brain dump, is to literally just start speaking. And there's a million apps and tools out there now that can do that. Um, and it's really a great way uh, to get the information out. And it, it does help, I find, people with the block um, when they mm. sit, they're staring at that blank sheet on their computer and they go, uh, where do I start? Just start talking. Start talking. Start talking. Yep. Wow. And do you, um, how far should they go? Should they go try to go all the way from beginning to end? No, no, I would recommend <laughs> doing it. This is, it's going to be a long process. And a lot of the talking will be stuff that doesn't make any sense or is not relevant to the story. Um, and those gets, they get cut out later on. Um, but, um, you know, the, the true, self I feel like comes out when when people just talk and um but talk in um with intention right so let's say your mm -hmm. brain dump reveals that you want to talk about your career well then set aside time that in this session you would talk about your career and your years or mm -hmm. your college education and then Maybe, you know, a, a little while or a day or so later, then talk about another topic. Um, but I wouldn't try to do it all at one time because then then feelings and emotions and thoughts get too jumbled because you're trying to get it all out in one session mm -hmm. versus taking it in small bites. So do you have a, a system for doing that? Like how, how would they organize all that? It seems like it could get messy very quick. <laughs> yeah, it could get messy very, very quickly. Um, uh, the key to organizing is calling – is doing it um, in – in groups, meaning um, doing it like, uh, you know, today you're going to talk about um, uh, your childhood, right? And then when you have that audio file, then you call that file aud your childhood and that becomes a chapter, right? So mm -hmm. I would recommend doing them kind of broken down into chapters, which can be moved around and, and changed later on. But the best way to do that is by doing it as chapters. Ah, and then you just kind of put all those into a folder? You got it. Ah, okay. Um, do you, uh, I know a lot of authors like to do mind mapping. Do you feel like that helps? I'm not familiar with it, honestly. So um, if you could tell me a little bit about what you're referring to, I can certainly comment. Oh, okay. So mind mapping is where you kind of put an idea that you're thinking about and then you, um, you surround it with uh, ideas that are related to it. And then for each of those, you surround them with ideas related to that. And so that's where my mind first jumped to when you talked about the audio thing. I was like, oh, that's kind of like audio mind mapping yes. almost. Yes, absolutely. It, it, it is. Uh, it's a great way to call it. I, I just didn't call it that. But yes, it's, it's the same thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and then, okay, so I, I can already kind of see this coming together. You know, you've got your, your idea for a story. Uh, you do your brain dump to kind of get an idea about uh, what is it at its core? What are you trying? What story are you trying to tell? Um, you know, you're, you've identified uh, who you think is going to be your audience, whether it's your your family or uh, a wider audience. Um, you know, you found out. Um, okay, I'm trying to tell a story about faith, so maybe my audience is a faith based audience. So these are the things that are going to be most interesting to them. And then you start doing your audio recordings, uh, diving into the different topics, working out your chapters. Um, Let's see what's what's next after that. I guess then you would try to um, just start editing it, or am I am I missing a step here? No. Uh, well, organization is you know although you've put them now in your audio files into chapters, now you have to put it all together, right? And that's okay. where the kind of the organization comes in. Um, and at that point, it's a good idea to have an outline to follow. Um, yes, you've got all these great stories and this information, but you need to be able to say, okay, this is the order that I want it in. Maybe you want it to jump around between um, time periods in your life, or do you want it chronologically? But that's the time to start organizing to determine what order do I want all of this in? Because that will also determine the flow of it, right? Although mm -hmm. there's lots of stories, um, it needs to be readable for, for the an audience it needs to make sense so just having mm -hmm. like all of these chapters dumped together isn't going to help but now it's a matter of putting it together so that it flows it's organized and that's where an outline would come in once you okay. have the outline then i would su suggest then then you could put the chapters in order and then the, the editing would begin um and the editing would take out a lot of those those little 
comments or details that you don't that you we talked about before that are not may not be relevant. Sure. It takes out all of those things that we all say those connectors, right? Those yeah. ums and uhs, which an, a recording will capture, of course. Um, but um, exactly, <laughs> it, you know, that's the time to take all of those things out. So there is some in- editing involved, and then at that point, and once the editing is done, then you see, wow, I really have a story. And then, then it gets down to um, the next step would be um, finalizing the editing. And the, and the the last part of the editing is is for grammar and punctuation and spelling and all and, and all of those things to make it really uh, into a finished product. Mm-hmm. I just want to break down a little bit the outline. Uh, what 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 do you uh, recommend in in terms of outlining? Um, that's really kind of a free flowing document. Um, and it's up to the author. You know, some people may want to start their story at the end and talk about what they're mm-hmm. doing now. Um, some people like to have a very detailed outline, including um, specifics. Um, me, personally, I, my outline is very generic. Like, I like to know about this is childhood and this is family. And, but it, it's very, mm-hmm. it can be as detailed or as broad as the person likes. Um, and what will be helpful for them to be really its goal as a guide sure and so the big goal of the outline because you said it could be detailed or it could be less detailed so the main Mm -hmm. like what's the main purpose you're trying to achieve with it you're just trying to get kind of like uh an eagle's eye view of it or you're trying to get the order of it right or kind of well i would i would say more of like a ten thousand foot view of ten thousand foot view Right. So it's so you're not looking at the eagles. Well, I guess you want to look at it from the eagles view. Yes. From above. Um, you're looking at it as, you know, what um, what are the major components of the story and what are the what is the flow? What is the organization? Um, and mm-hmm. it can it, it can be fluid. So let's say you, you know, you're moving uh, in the chronological order and all of a sudden you realize, well, that's not really how you want it. The the outline can be changed or the storyline can be changed. But it's really mm-hmm. as a guy. It's really how I see the, the, the outline as a guide. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so you're using the outline as a, as a guide to try and find the areas that aren't so fluid. Uh, you know, let, let's talk about uh, fluidness for a second. Is it, is it mostly w- – what are the common problems you find? Like ha- have you ever been reading through um, one of your clients' work and you find something that just shouts out to you that it's not fluid? You know, what, what yeah. are some kind of common mistakes that you see? Sure. Um, uh, on both sides, I see where there's something in the outline that was not included in the story or something mm-hmm. on the story that was not included on the outline. So the, mm-hmm. the second one is not so bad um, because obviously that's going to happen. And it, the more detailed your outline, the more things that would be included. But what's what's worse? First is when you have something in the outline that was not included. But again, that's the purpose of the mm-hmm. outline. You can, you know, you may think that you've gotten all of your story out or or shared all the information, and then you go back to your original outline and you realize, oh wait, I forgot this. So it kind of keeps the author on track, gives them a guide. Um, but that's a mis- uh, you know a mistake that that I see often is that they um, forget things or add things that, that maybe they didn't originally intend. So it's, it is definitely a work in progress. It's a fluid, fluid document that is again, just acts as a guide. Okay, sure. Um, all right. So let's say that they've got their, um, first draft finished. Um, they've, uh, reached the editing stage. Um, what do you recommend in terms of editing? Because I think that can be a little daunting. Would you bring on an editor, or is that where they would call you up? You know, is that where they would say, "Hey, Rachel, help me"? Or uh, how does how does that yeah. stage happen? Yes, absolutely. Um, editing is something that I offer um, because it is very daunting for a couple of reasons. One, now you're faced with all of this possibly raw information, this raw data, right? That. Um, mm-hmm. When I say raw, I mean it's got the ums and the uhs and the you know the side comments, et cetera. Um, mm-hmm. uh, it's raw. And then a lot of people don't have the confidence in their um, in their spelling, grammar, et cetera. So to mm-hmm. alleviate the that burden of now now running into that block and say, oh my gosh, now I can't finish this book because what if my spelling is wrong? That's where an editor comes in. And an editor is the one that's going to actually check all that stuff to ensure mm-hmm. that you're not going to be publishing something that 
has that's riddled with spelling and grammar mistakes because the editor is going to catch that. They're going to catch it if you put two periods at the end of the sentence instead of just one. The editor is going to. I almost feel like that's a big uh, issue people would run into when yes. they start typing their first page. They're immediately going to start typing sentences and it, it flows well in their head. And then they're like, oh man, I, I don't even yeah. know how to approach the grammar. Yeah. And all of that, I tell authors, don't even worry about that. All of that gets gets worked out in the wash, right? It all comes out in the end. Um, an editor will not allow you to finish a product or publish a product that um, has poor grammar, right? There, it's so it's almost more important to just get started, you know? And is it that is. why you recommend the audio files? Absolutely. Absolutely. The audio files to me are the, the key because it just h- helps somebody get over that. In an audio file, there is no difference between the word there and there. But you and I both know mm-hmm. that there's two different meanings and two different uses for that word and its spellings. Yeah. Um, the audio file is going to write one of them. It may not necessarily be the right, the correct one of it. Um, but that's mm-hmm. where the editor comes in and says, okay, uh, in the content context of this sentence and what the person is talking about, which word is appropriate? And that's what it's going to to the editor is, in my opinion, the key to bringing the words to life because um, they're mm. going to clean it up and make it pretty and aesthetically pleasing as well as proper. Proper, and not, I'm not saying that everybody has to have proper English or proper, you know, grammar. Um, it could be, but this is also where the per- the author's tone comes out. Um, mm. You know, if, if they typically say the word y'all, an editor mm. is not going to take that out because that's part of their character. That's part of ah. who they are. I would never take out, if a person is from the South, I would never take out the word y'all if I was editing a document because that's who they are. That's how they speak. You know, I Unless, actually find of course, that, they, that they kind of that. surprising because I feel like, you know, some people might be embarrassed about that. They're like, you know, I do say y'all and I'm, I'm embarrassed to put that out there. But you're saying that's part of the character of it. It is. It is. I don't use the word y'all in my speech, so uh, I would take it out if I said it. But if you're from the South and you typically or you typically say y'all um, and that's who your character is, I wouldn't take it out because that's your tone of voice. And, you know, one of the things that I pride myself on is I, I like to speak in the author's voice. So if I'm in doing an editing project, I make mm. sure that I don't take out those things that make the person who they are. Because mm. again, we all have a story. This isn't my, this isn't Rachel's story. I'm not going to change the words to the words that Rachel would use. I'm going to use those words that, that Jonathan would use. I'm going to mm-hmm. leave those little phrases in there. Those little, um, you know, there, there's things that you say that I don't, and I wouldn't take those mm-hmm. out because that's how you speak. That's your tone of voice. And somebody mm-hmm. who's reading it wants to be able to hear, let's say your family, let's say your wife wants to read your story someday. She wants to be able to read it and hear audibly your voice. Ah. And, and I'll give you an, a quick example before I have to run, actually. Um, my my quick example. I, I was working with a with a young lady who was from Argentina. English was not her first language. She mm-hmm. um, said words that we chuckled about in our audio recordings, um, but um, we left them in there. We left in the little uh, grammar mistakes that she made in her English, because ultimately mm. um, her goal was to leave this book for her children because she was dying of stage four cancer. Um, Mm. So she wanted her children to read the book and to audibly hear her voice in her written words. Uh. So we, we left all of those things in there. Ultimately, sadly, she passed away a few months ago, but Mm. now her children can read and hear her story in her words. So I think that's very valuable and very, very important. Wow. Yeah. I, I didn't even think of, of that as, I mean, that's a serious thing, you know, to, to be able to leave something of yourself with your children in, in, in that. Yeah. Wow. Um, I kind of wished that I had that for my grandpa, actually, uh, he passed away and sometimes I miss him. If I could just kind of, um, hear his voice in a, a work like that, that would mean the world to me. So that's right. yeah. awesome. Yep. Awesome. So, okay, so I want to respect that you have to head out. Um, so this has been the second ever episode, and if any of you are interested in uh, hearing more from Rachel Atterbury, you can find her on her Sia Guru page at 
uh, seeaguru.com forward slash Rachel Arterberry. And thank you so much for listening.